We're going to try to do a highlight video here with some NFL Week 11 game breakdowns. We'll see if Zoom allows us to do it. I'm host Adam Burke. That's Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. And Brian, one thing we do have here is a pretty good Thursday night game in the NFC West, Arizona and Seattle. This line's pretty much three with extra juice market-wide. Total anywhere from 57.5 to 58.5, depending on where you look. So the expectation of points, very much a thing here. And it feels like consumer confidence in the Seahawks has kind of gone down over the last couple of weeks. Well, here's the deal. You got three teams atop the NFC West at six and three. Uh, I think Seattle's the play here all day long. I can't believe this number's come down to three. And again, it's the world we're living in with the reactions games you just saw. They're, everything's baked in the cake here, man. I mean, listen. Seattle's lost to Arizona. Seattle has lost to the Rams. They're in peril here from a tiebreaker perspective to win this division. They have to win this game. This game is Seattle's season. Now, they can get in as a wild card, certainly. But if they want to win the division, they've got to win this game. If they lose this game, Arizona's got a two-game lead on them. Not one, two, because of tiebreakers. And it's a short week. You're going on the road. And Arizona you would think is coming off, you know, one of the biggest letdowns of the year where Miami beat them, Buffalo beat them, and then they get the miracle. Allen took them down the field, won the game. You do that 99 times out of 100. God bless him. Hopkins makes that play. So Arizona gets this win. You know, yeah, can you take it, run with it? I guess, but to me, short week, going on the road, Seattle's got to circle the wagons, letdown spot for Arizona. And if you go inside that first game they played, Adam, the final score was 37-34. And in that game, I believe Wilson threw three interceptions. And Seattle had a 10-point lead with like five minutes to go, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going from memory. And Seattle got real conservative and started playing the clock and gave Arizona a chance. And, of course, Arizona got, to, got that chance, took it, got the overtime, and won the game. But throughout the meat and potatoes of that game, Seattle was the better team. Unless I'm missing something, everything points to Seattle. And I'd be betting that today because I think common sense is going to kick in and this number is going to go through three. I think the one thing that we've really found out about Seattle through their losses and you know through these last two performances for them is – They don't have a running game. Well – Russell Wilson, defense has, sucks. Russell Wilson has to be flawless because this defense yeah. is God awful. And Russell yeah. Wilson has not been flawless the last two weeks. And as you mentioned, had some turnover issues in that game against Arizona that allowed them to kind of hang around and then put themselves in a position to win the game in overtime. So that's the question that I have here is, is something wrong with Russell Wilson? Is there just something going on with this guy? And he did take some shots in that game against Buffalo. So I don't know if maybe there's a nagging injury or something else, but if he's not flawless, if he doesn't take care of the football, this Seattle team is not good because as you said, they cannot run it and they can't stop anybody. So that's sort of the handicap here to me. And he, I don't know the answer. I think Russell Wilson is obviously, you know, good enough to win the MVP. I think Russell Wilson is a top three quarterback in the NFL, maybe the best quarterback in the NFL, given what he has to work with, uh, you know, with no running game and all the things he's overcome throughout his career. But the thing about it here is, is there something wrong with him? Because if he's not 100% either mentally or physically, this defense is very hard to bet on laying points. Well, I, I don't think we have to overanalyze it. I think they're, they're not free fall, but their speed bumps have gotten bigger. And it all coincided with the injury to Carson. You know, Russell Wilson this, Russell Wilson that. But when – and honestly – it couldn't happen at a worse time. It was Carson and Carlos Hyde. I mean, either, you know, Hyde, the drop off from Carson to Hyde's not that significant, but the drop off from Carson to Hyde to DJ Dallas and a Homer and the new guy they just threw in is ma massive. I, I think you can, we know their defense stinks, but, but, but I think it's that simple. The teams are playing like a cover two. They're like, they can't run the ball. So, they got safeties, you know, playing 10 yards off the line of scrimmage. They're not letting Lockett or Metcalf get deep on them because they don't have a running game. If Carson or Hyde were there and teams played that defense, Seattle go right down the field. 
Well, I think it's certainly an interesting game, and the best bet in this game is to sign up over at BetMGM Sportsbook as a new user with the promotion here for Thursday Night Football. Bet $1 on either money line. You win $100 in free bets if a touchdown is scored in the game. And as Brian and I just talked about, you've got two pretty poor defenses here, two good quarterbacks in Russell Wilson and Kyler Murray. A touchdown will be scored. So head over to ATS.io and read up more on that bet $1, win $100 in free bets promotion over at BetMGM Sportsbook. Brian, moving to Sunday here, I don't really want to talk about the Eagles and the Browns because as I ta- as I tweeted on Sunday, even when the Browns win, I lose because I had them minus three and a half in the Circa, minus three in the market, so that was a push for me. I want to talk about Atlanta and New Orleans here. Total 51 and a half on this game. Spread anywhere from four and a half to five, depending on where you look. It will be Jameis Winston and probably a lot of Taysom Hill, Sean Payton's best friend, with Drew Brees out with the collapsed lung and the broken ribs. Look, I don't know if this line should have moved from six, six and a half, because I don't know if at this point in time, the drop off from Drew Brees and how limited he is throwing the ball downfield is really all that different to what Jameis Winston can do. It's just a matter of does Winston turn the football over a bunch and how much does that impact the Saints in this game? Well, everything you just said is just right. Uh, the funny thing is, at first blush, you're going, oh, Drew Brees is out, Jameis Winston's out. Maybe the bigger impact should be the total, and, and that total would plummet. When the reality of it is, maybe the total should go up. And you think of what Winston was doing with the Bucks. I mean, he can make some electric plays. Uh, he's got a cannon. He can stretch the field. And New Orleans has not stretched the field. But watch a guy like maybe Traquan Smith get a little more involved. Watch them start throwing a lot of the uh, – not a lot, but more passes to stretch the field. Kamara, you you can't stop him. But like you said, on top of the great things he can do, his defining nature is to make a bad mistake that produces instant points. So – I think maybe the over is actually the thing you consider here. And I'm on board with you. The, the advanced number was seven and a half. Now you got Atlanta coming off a bye. But for that number to come all the way down to four and a half, all you got to do is go back a calendar year. Breeze was out. He's going to be out a long time. And you're like, well, if they can just, you know, stay afloat, play 500 football till Breeze comes back, they'll be okay. Well, Teddy Bridgewater just won game after game after game after game. Well, the Saints won game after game after game with Teddy Bridgewater. What's to say they can't do the same thing here with Jameis Winston? And, oh, by the way, I mean, it's a a great opportunity for Winston. Um, Outside chance, if he plays really well for the next five, six weeks, that maybe there's a chance to resurrect his career to not be a guy holding a clipboard. Uh, and there are teams that are out there that are just dying on the vine for quarterbacks. A, did you watch that game last night? You know, uh, I wonder if Winston doesn't take this opportunity and run with it. And maybe it's the resurrection of his career. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, Winston had some opportunities to go other places, but he took a one-year deal with New Orleans in hopes that, you know, either being, you know, there in the same quarterback room as Drew Brees or maybe getting a chance to play like the opportunity he may have going forward here would get him that multi-year deal to be a clear cut starter for a team that needs a quarterback. So there's a lot on the line here for him, for sure. The team that that may need be the may need the quarterback. uh, Obviously the clock's ticking real fast is right where he is. That's true. What a great opportunity for him to audition for Sean Payton. Who's just so thoroughly infatuated with Taysom Hill. But, you know, Winston says, if I go there, I get a chance or whatever. I'm competing with a guy that's kind of a a hybrid and, you know, will it or can it work? And Peyton says Hill's really effective when we use set packages for him when he comes in as opposed to him being in there the whole time. So in in a bizarre way for New Orleans, they're okay this year, and it maybe helps Peyton uh, make a real firm decision what life after Drew Brees is going to be. It, it could be manna from heaven for this team. No, that's absolutely true. And, you know, you talk about this injury for Drew Brees, and, you know, I mean, the guy is, you know, getting up there in years, to say the least. So I think that's an excellent point that you make here. And what pass has he thrown? And you're right. 
But what pass has he thrown longer than 30 yards this year? Yeah, not many. Yeah, not many at all. I mean, Winston now gives them – this is going to be very interesting to see how much they rein him in, or do they actually expand the playbook with an athletic quarterback? Well, and more to that point, I mean, the more I think about this game, the more I actually really like New Orleans. I mean, their defense is coming around in a very big way. As long as Winston doesn't throw pick sixes, I think they'll be good to cover in this game. Because something else here with Atlanta, and and maybe this is just some recency bias, but you think about some of the teams that were coming off of buys last week. The Bengals were uncompetitive. The Eagles looked like shit against the Giants. I mean, they looked terrible in that game. I think you could argue... And I don't know if this would apply to Andy Reid and the Chiefs coming off the bye. But I think you could argue that the bye week is a massive detriment this season because all these guys have to do right now is play football. They can't go out and do anything because they don't want to get COVID. They don't want to cost their teammates or anything like that. Teams can't practice. They have to take that full week off now for the bye week. The NFL changed that a couple of years ago. I think you're better off playing week after week after week, having that routine, going to practice, doing video, working out, all that, then going home to your family. Because on a bye week, you have nothing to do because you can't go out there and potentially put your team or yourself at risk with these COVID protocols. And because you can't practice anymore, I think the importance of the bye week had already waned a little bit anyway. So I think a team like Atlanta that's not going anywhere couldn't really do anything during the bye, has a lame duck head coach in all likelihood in Raheem Morris. I think the bye is a detriment for them. I like New Orleans quite a bit here this week. I know it's kind of a square public type of play, but I think the Saints are in a great spot here because you've got maybe the most motivated Jameis Winston has ever been. And by the way, he looks in better shape than he did his last couple of years in Tampa Bay. And you have an Atlanta team that I think, you know, I think some some laziness could have settled in over the bye week. And by the way, just listening to you talk, it just got me thinking a little bit. It's something to don't forget. It's like out of sight, out of mind, and gone. And I'm sure you'll you'll add to this for me. But specifically, uh, Denver and New England. I and Denver's already kind of a bit of a mess. But don't forget, Denver and New England basically aren't getting a buy. Because they practiced all week to play that game, and then it got postponed, and then they just played it again the next week. And there were several other teams that have been impacted where a bye is not part of the equation. And it's, it's a realistic possibility that those teams, when we get to mid-December, could hit a wall. No, that's, that's a good point. That's a very good point. To say the other, who are the other teams? I, Den, Denver, New England immediately come to mind. Uh, the Baltimore? irony of irony. Wasn't Baltimore Tennessee, another one? Tennessee was the root of the problem. Look, and Tennessee was the root of the problem. And Tennessee's, you know, coming off a bye. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, uh, I, I know for sure it was uh, Denver and New England. And you now Baltimore looks like they've played straight through. Well, Baltimore had that, that one game pushed back, if I remember correctly. Uh, earlier on in the year I, I yeah I mean this this is just such a unique year in, in so many yeah. different ways but like I said I think the bye week is actually a detriment here you know to these teams unless they absolutely need it because they're so ravaged by injuries but that was Philadelphia last week they got a bunch of guys back and they were really uncompetitive and quite sloppy in that game against the Giants who play really hard week after week they're not a good team but they play really hard every single week so I don't know just some food for thought I guess uh, and, you know, with regards to that Atlanta New Orleans game. And another thing, you know, I haven't done this, um, but I, I would not favorites and dogs, but I, I we should look this up. Just home and road teams. You know, is, is travel? What is the impact on, on travel and the, the the way this thing has gone in this unique year? Just home and road teams. As simple as that. Not favorites and dogs, and. I was thinking that the, the road teams could actually have a fair amount of success, but I'm, I'm looking at this past week and the home day home teams had a field day. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking caught at, up. It, it was, was very big for the away teams up until, you know, recently here. The Tampa Bay was a road winner. 
The only road team that won this past week was Tampa Bay. I mean, the Bills were on the road, had the game won, and, you know, we know what happened there. But, but look at that. Only one road team won until you got to Monday night when Minnesota was hard-pressed to beat Chicago. So the home teams this past week fared quite well. A couple of other games I want to pick your brain about here for week 11 real quickly. New England laying a road price of two and a half at Houston. This is a very interesting line because Houston was favored on the look ahead lines. Houston doesn't really do much in a bad weather game against Cleveland, New England. They actually looked the part against Baltimore. They've made some adjustments. Bill Belichick reminding everybody why he's one of the best in the business. And now they're laying two and a half going to Houston, a Houston team that has only beaten Jacksonville this year. And they've done that twice a team accustomed to being in the mix to win the division, get into the playoffs, try to do something when they get there, that won't happen this year. And I think that's where tanking comes in more than anything. Teams just aren't as focused when they're not reaching the expectations that they're accustomed to. Can you possibly lay a number with New England on the road here, though? No. New England can play with the lead. See, I, New England to me is like the Bears. If the Bears get the lead, good luck to you. If New England gets the lead, good luck to you. But if they get behind, they can't come from behind. So, you know, so much of this is dictated by how the game actually starts. Now, Belichick, you know, give him full marks. I mean, you know, he knows how to take things away from you. Basically, what's he going to do here? He's going to take Will Fuller away. You know, but... Watson's a guy that can run around and make plays with his feet, but I, I, I still think the New England offense is just – I mean, how, how about the, a chance to seal the game? I mean, the, the, the pass – and I know the weather was awful, but, I mean, that's you and me playing catch in the driveway. Newton missed the touchdown pass from the five-yard line that, you know, puts the game away. I don't know. I, it's hard it, – to me, it's very hard to trust either one of these teams. Uh, I certainly like the quarterback uh, for Houston a lot better than the quarterback for the Patriots. Yeah, I think that's fair. And, and, you know, I watched a lot of that Houston Cleveland game last week. And frankly, I thought Houston was a lot more creative with their play calling. Despite the bad weather, they put a lot more trust into Sean Watson than the Browns put in Baker Mayfield. And, and I can't fault them for that at all. Um, you know, Watson had them in scoring areas twice. They scored the one touchdown after they fell behind 10, nothing, then got stopped inside the five. I was kind of impressed with, with Watson in that regard. What I wasn't impressed with was Romeo Cornell wasted two timeouts in the second half. He called a timeout on fourth and two to kick a 46 yard field goal in 60 mile per hour wins, which was just mind blowing to me. Would have needed that timeout late in the game. I don't know if it would have mattered, but would have been nice to have it in a game where nobody was really going to get margin and you had to figure those timeouts would be important. So I think Cornell is just not getting the job done in Houston. You know, you look at their game against Jacksonville. They didn't even cover the number in that one. They got their bump. They got their bump when they covered against Jacksonville and then took Tennessee to the wire and probably should have won that game against the Titans. Since then, it's been downhill for Houston. So even though I don't like New England, I could not entertain Houston at all here. And frankly, I don't think I'll have a bet on Houston the rest of the season. No, I agree. And honestly... I'd be inclined. I think this total's high. I uh, did 48 and a half. I, I just think it's high. I think Belichick will do what he can to slow down Watson. And I think on a week to week basis, I think new England is more than content if they can get the running game going or it's the re run pass option or the RPO and Newton's running the, I think the clock's running on, all right, got Brian Blessing back here. I'll have to do an edit with that. I'm not sure what I can do with the video, but I'll do the best I can there with the audio. Brian, last thing, you know, you've already done highlight videos for us over on our ATS YouTube page, looking at the Packers, Colts, Chiefs, and Raiders, and also Rams and Bucks. Anything else on this card now that we've got all the games lined and posted that, that stands out to you in any way? Yeah, I kind of like the Rams. Uh, on the Monday night game at Tampa Bay, I, I think that defense is pretty good. Um, and, you know, Tampa Bay, I don't know if they got well against Carolina, but, I mean, 
they took out their frustration on Carolina, but I'm not about to say, oh, Tampa Bay's back. Um, I, I think that was a nice win for the Rams over Seattle. And if they could contain Russell Wilson the way they did, what will they be able to do against the stationary target that Tom Brady is? Brady will still do good things, I'm sure. Uh, but I, I, I like uh, – I like the Rams catching the points, and I, you know, if you can get the hook, uh, the plus three and a half looks pretty attractive to me. And the other thing is, the weird anomaly is, you know, this is t- uh, the Rams' fifth trip, fifth to the Eastern Time Zone. They're two and two. They they got beat in both games. The AFC opponents, AFC East opponents, um, they played a hard fought game in Buffalo. Got pitchforked by Miami, but then they handled Philly and Washington. So, you know, all right, let's go beyond the AFC East. They they lost their two out-of-conference games. Now they're going back East where they seem to be pretty comfortable in their own skin. Yeah, and they get the extra day, too, playing a Monday night football. I don't know if I love a side in that game. I do like the under 47 and a half, though. I think this is a game where you know the Rams can contain Brady a little bit. You've got the pass rush with Aaron Donald, of course. You've got you're know, really a stars and stiffs unit for the Rams. And I think they have enough stars back there in the secondary to kind of contain Brady a little bit. And I don't think Goff does a whole lot against this Tampa Bay defense, which grades very well by the advanced metrics, grades very well in a lot of different areas. They had issues with the Saints a couple of weeks ago, but outside of that, you know, they've been a very solid unit here this year. And Jared Goff just against good defenses generally doesn't impress me a whole lot. He's not good in the face of pressure if the Bucs are able to get any of that. So I kind of like the under in that one, under 47 and a half. Um, that one has come down a little bit from 48 and a half. But no thoughts on the side. I like the under, though. But I, one other one I just I, I got to throw out there. Uh, and, and timing is everything. I mean, what do we always say? It's like a generic thing, but it's true. It, you know, who you bet, fine. But in many instances, when you bet is just as important. And yesterday I had just gotten off the air at two o'clock our time. And I was, I, I'm looking, I happened to be on the app at the time. And I'm like, is this right? And I'm, I hit the button and I'm in the meat of the, the guts of the building and the wheels spinning of trying to find a location. I literally ran outside. So the bet would go through Kansas city at the, at Vegas. Uh, the opener was seven and or six and a half, and, and then it went to seven, said it's going to go to seven. And then yesterday, I don't know, somebody dumped a bus uh, on the Raiders, and the Raiders, listen, very quietly, six and three, doing a lot of good things. But this thing dropped to five and a half. I ran outside. I liked, I liked the Chiefs and got the bet in. Here's the deal. We know about, okay, I'm not telling you anything. You know about Andy Reid off a bye. All right, that's the starting point. You've got revenge. The Chiefs' only blemish is at the hands of the Raiders. Throw this bus thing in where the the Raiders did a victory lap around the stadium. Okay, teams like to manufacture billboard garbage. So, there, but there's that. But I just think that the Kansas City, with revenge, coming off a of bye, I think they show up in a big way, and they are gonna they are going to produce a truckload of points. And I think they'll do a better job defending because the Raiders played a great game against them, but Ruggs and Aguilar were getting deep on them. I mean, I think the chiefs will make the ad- adjustment that they won't get beat over the top. They w- did in the first game. I, I, and it's no knock on the Raiders. I mean, I just think this is a, a bad spot for the Raiders. If they win this game, then the Raiders are the real deal. But I think Kansas City takes him to the woodshed. Kansas City, to me, is a lot like an Olympic athlete that's running some sort of distance race or, you know, doing some sort of cross-country skiing or something like that. When you're really good, you just know when you can relax a little bit, when you can kind of take your foot off the gas, kind of gather yourself in some respects, stuff like that. Kansas City's done it a couple times. They did it against Carolina. They did it against the Raiders. The difference is they beat Carolina. They didn't beat the Raiders. They've had some spots this year where it's just kind of, I think it's more telltale for the Chiefs that we know, all right, Andy Reid's either going to hold something back or they're not going to show everything 
or Mahomes is going to make sure he doesn't take any unnecessary abuse, stuff like that. They had a spot like that against the Raiders earlier on in the year. Now the tables have turned. This is a much different spot for Kansas City to the point where, like you said, if they want to make a statement, they can and will do it. And I think I would definitely look more towards that side than taking Vegas here in this one. Haven't decided if I'm going to have a play on side or total here yet. Uh, maybe Kansas City first half, something I could consider because they probably do come out ready to go here in this one. Uh, but you, know, you, you probably won't find me with a Raiders ticket, that's for sure. Well, I I, I, re- I really like this guy. I, I mean, I, I I think it's Woodshed City. I think I think Kansas City's about sending a message, a little revenge, which is a good thing. They're fresh. They're coming out. They're they're ready to to go on a little tootsie roll here. But the here we go again, Adam, with people looking at the last thing they saw and overreacting, like, oh my God, the Chiefs barely lost at Carolina, and then Carolina went and got absolutely killed. Well, wait a minute. The Chiefs lost to Carolina in a game that Christian McCaffrey played in. And then Bridgewater gets hurt. And Carolina got killed. Well, But nobody connects the dots properly. No, I think that's fair. I mean, again, you know, Kansas City is they're, – they're just one of those – they just have feel. I mean, they just, they just get it. You know, they just completely understand. And, okay, fine. They lost against the spread against Carolina. They won the game 33-31. So they did escape – with a victory, and, and that's it. I mean, it's a bottom line business. They're not worried about covering numbers and stuff like that. But remember, off the Vegas game, they covered three straight, Buffalo, Denver, and the Jets. I know Denver and the Jets are awful, but they also won those games comfortably. So you know, they made the plays they had to defensively against Drew Locke. They didn't play their greatest game against Denver. But teams just know when to hit a stride. Teams just know when to flip that switch. I think Kansas City probably does know better than anybody else in the NFL when to flip that switch. So I'll do what I can with the editing for the highlight video here. I know we had a couple of lags and stopping points uh, on the Zoom call here, and I'll edit the audio as well. But make sure you subscribe to the full editions of ATS Radio on Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Podbean, TuneIn, wherever you stream and download your podcast content. 